Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for joining us to this How To Academy event. Tonight, we are joined by Nick Offerman, actor, writer, and woodworker, best known as the character of Ron Swanson in NBC's hit comedy series, Parks and Recreation. This conversation will explore what it means to have love and pride in a place and how against all the odds it may still be possible to build a new pastoral, not a utopia, but somewhere decent for us all. Without further ado, welcome Nick. Thank you very kindly for having me and uh, welcome to everybody tuning in uh, to this strange information delivery system that we now live in. Um, I, uh, I grew up in a family that is uh, somewhat agricultural in Illinois in the Midwest. And um, I, I was a typical child, uh, did not enjoy work, but I was fascinated with my grandfather and uncles uh, and aunts and grandmother working on the farm. And uh, even though I became an artist and an actor professionally, I've always been um, really besotted with the writing uh, of agrarian thought with this notion that um, that we as a civilization should always be paying more attention, uh, be paying fidelity to the nature uh, from which we glean our living and, you know, uh, among which we live. And that fascination sort of centered on the writing of Wendell Berry and other great sort of uh, agrarian writing led me incongruously via Twitter to uh, a, a shepherd from England's Lake District, uh, an area called Cumbria. Um, and uh, eventually this, this um, sort of curt, slightly curmudgeonly, uh, poetic, hardworking shepherd caught my attention and we became friends over social media. Uh, of all things. And eventually I got to go stay with him and his family. Um, I'm a huge fan of the work that he does. Now he, he's a shepherd, uh, but he also had a very popular hit book called The Shepherd's Life, which made him very well known. And between that and, and his social media work, uh, he's become quite popular. Some also say it's because of his cheekbones. And I say that's one of the questions we're looking to answer today. So um, I would like to introduce my good friend uh, and teacher, James Rebax. Uh, hi, Nick. Um, how are you doing? You okay? So far, so good. Thank you. I'm, I'm keeping healthy. You're looking, you're looking good. Last time I saw you had like a bigger beard. Well, as an actor, uh, my, my whiskers and my hairdo come, they, they uh, they transmogrify depending on what role I'm playing. Yeah. You're, you're looking very healthy. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I was getting a little chubby, so I thought I had a book coming out. Maybe I should lose a little bit of weight. And um, so, yeah, I'm feeling a lot better for that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's funny you, the, when, when you hear that the newspaper is going to come take your picture, suddenly you think maybe I, Maybe I should only have two pints tonight. <laughs> there's, only, there's only so many chins that a man needs, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> one one and, and one spare in case you lose the first one. So we're right. here celebrating the, the publication of this beautiful new book by James called English Pastoral, in case you have somehow stumbled into this chat without knowing that. Um, it's really quite astonishing. And, uh, and James, I'd, I'd like to dive in and ask you uh, some questions about the, the mentality of this book. Um, first and foremost, you know, do you have a, a sort of elevator pitch? Like, what is it about this time and your place that, uh, that drove you to write this book? So uh, re really, it's a book about my growing up in a farming world, a little bit like some of your relatives in the American Midwest, but a sort of English Upland version. And this isn't an elevator pitch, by the way. This is where my, my editor starts pulling her hair out because I, I, I screwed this up, but never mind. Um, it really tells the story about how the English landscape changed. Uh, the English countryside, English farming changed. 
over the last 40 or 50 years. And uh, yeah, and it starts in the, the fields of my grandfather's farming, which in many ways was the tail end of a sort of agricultural epoch or era that had stretched back for many centuries in some ways. Uh, and then it tells the story about a more, um, and dare I say, more American, more sort of industrialized, more chemical based agriculture comes to Britain. And uh, it tells the story of me initially, like lots of other people, thinking that was the future. And even if I love the old fashioned patchwork of fields that my grandfather had and the old ways of doing things that it didn't really matter that this was the future and uh, young Mr. Rebank should get with the program and should embrace these things and do them. Uh, and then the, the latter part of the book is about my growing realization over the last 20, 25 years that, that that might not actually have been very well thought through, that we might be screwing up the land, that many of the things that environmentalists and ecologists are telling us uh, are actually true, even if they're difficult to hear as a farmer, that we're in many cases wrecking the soil that we, that we live on. Uh, we're stripping the land of a lot of the, the birds, the insects and other things that, that really ought to be there, that were there until recently. And yeah, and really, it's, this is a lousy elevator pitch, but never mind. And it's about, um, it's about me coming to terms with thinking, thinking through a kind of philosophy of what, what it means to be a farmer now. And I think 20 years ago, my philosophy of farming was that my job was to produce as much food as possible as efficiently and as industrially as possible. Uh, and I now realize that that's a very incomplete way of looking at the world. And I know we have a mutual friend in Wendell Berry, but um, it's taken me about to the age of 46 to realize that uh, that gentleman over there in Henry County, Kentucky, was actually right a very long time ago. And I, I only started reading his work about five years ago, around about when my first book came out. But um, he's, he's essentially right. And I think farming matters in ways that we've forgotten about. And yeah, so this is the worst elevator pitch. This must be a very long elevator ride, but uh, yeah. that's kind of it. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, <laughs> to me, the reason that, uh, that we're so passionate about this subject is because in so many ways, uh, I find it emblematic of American thought uh, in general, and and the uh, the the sort of um, the the tropes that we've been the the ruts that we've been existing in, kind of since the Industrial Revolution, <laughs> which you touched on, which is make as much money as possible, basically, whether you are running a college or a farm or a factory. Uh, the the fiscal report at the end of the year, the shareholders are God and everything else, don't worry about it. Um, you, you know, you end up with too much waste, dump it in the river. We don't, <laughs> it'll, the river will take it away and we won't have to worry and, about it. And, and uh, say again. That, uh, and that, that's right. And the, there, there are, I would be the first one to say this because I've long admired lots of things about America. It's, it's easy to laugh at America right now, but um, there's, a, there's an optimism in that. There's, a, there's an embrace of, uh, there's a sort of can-do attitude. There's a embracing new technologies. There's, there's even a sort of optimism about making, making all of our lives better, more freedom, more time, more leisure. A lot of that stuff sounds great. I mean, it, you know, why would you not want that after the Second World War? If you're, Brit if you're British in 1946, why would you not want cheaper food? Uh, why would you not want more holidays? Why would you not want more colour in your life like there is in the American sort of movies? So it's easy to see why people are seduced by that. But as you say, the, uh, anybody who cares to know uh, is now very clear that that, that dream has been a little naive, hasn't it? It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't acknowledge limits. It doesn't acknowledge constraints. Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff off stage happening that really matters. Yeah, we've yeah. we've come to learn that it's quite short sighted. You know, we in in the American Midwest we say, hey, if we pump the soil full of of these chemical fertilizers and use these insecticides and herbicides, uh, our yield is astonishing. It's massive. And, and it will be for at least three to seven years. <laughs> and then suddenly on, in the eighth year, we say, oh, no, shoot, we've ruined all the soil, now what? And, and um, our tendency, I think, 
is to believe that we can fix the problems caused by industrialization with further science, with further industrialization, with more technology. That, that, that's right. So, um, and, and I think the British, the British story post Second World War is we set off behind America. America comes out of the Second World War hugely powerful industrially, hugely wealthy. Uh, we're broke. Um, a lot of American things seem like a good idea and more or less we, we copy, we follow on. Um, what's the old saying? America sneezes and the rest of the world catches a cold. I think that's in, in farming terms, that's been true for the last 40 or 50 years. Um, yeah, it's, and really, what, as you know, what, one of the things my book says is, my book is sort of an English person living in a landscape that's been changed in that way looking at it at the end of a 40 year period and saying hang on a minute we we didn't think this through properly maybe we don't want this future maybe we want something slightly different and it's not as simple as just living in the past i can't i can't uh, just be my grandfather that that doesn't work um but there are lots of things in the british landscape which i think matter which aren't on that cost and profit um sheet it's in, in that way of thinking um but it was interesting. The first time you came to visit me, I, uh, and this will sound awful. I didn't really, I didn't really know who you were, did I? I took you, I put you to, took you to put a wall up on a hillside and we, we just worked together and we were friends before we knew anything else. I think it was good fun. Yeah. It was incredibly good fun. And, um, if, if you weren't familiar with me, I, I believe I take that, uh, as that means, that means you're smart. It means you uh, are reading books. <laughs> more than watching popular culture. But that, I mean, the, the thing is, uh, from the moment you picked me up at the train station, drove me to your farm, and, and we, it was, it was cold and, and drizzling, and you said, you wanna come help me mend a, a stone wall? And I said, sure. And I watched you bound up a hillside in the, in the middle of the day, and I was taken aback and just said, gosh, I, I seldom have seen a person leap to their work the way you were heading to this job that most people in their right minds, you would say, we're going to go up this wet, slippery hillside in, in you know, almost freezing, uh, like light rain and stack large, heavy stones into a wall. And... <laughs> We're, I think we get along so well because we both understand that that's a good time, that that is something that's really enjoyable. Um, by doing so, not only are you creating something of beauty, the, the wall itself is, is a means, is uh, the end, but also the means by which you are keep taking care of your flock. Like, as you explained to me, um, when the sheep feel that they have eaten enough of the grass, they begin to look at the wall and say, is, is there a bit we could knock down? Because I think there's grass on the other side of this wall. And so by fixing that, you know, by, by that one gentle uh, correction, that, that feels so much better. It feels like you're do doing something positive towards raising this flock, you know, towards the ultimate health of your farm. And so... You said to me later, what we were splitting wood one time up in the sheep barn, and you and we were we were busting our asses. We were working really hard, and you said, "Boy, it's it's a it's a good thing that you enjoy uh, working because otherwise we we couldn't be friends because it's, <laughs> it's splitting firewood is like is like going to Disneyland for me." So so can I ask you a question, Nick? Why? Why, why do you care? So you're, you're obviously a very, a very, very good, very, very successful actor. You, you don't have to care about walls. You don't have to care about woodwork and craft and your wood shop. How, how, does, Nick Offerman, how does Nick Offerman become a guy that cares about putting a dry stone wall up with me or running your wood shop? Where, where does that come from? Why do you care about that? Um, well, I, I, have, I have, for those who don't know, I have a wood shop in Los Angeles. I also, uh, and I have employees there and we make custom furniture and I, I build canoes and ukuleles and things out of wood. Um, I, you know, I was brought up by uh, the, the kind of parents that 
instilled uh, this work ethic in me. And I'm so grateful to them because I don't consider myself particularly clever. Um, but as, as I've stumbled through life, sort of, sort of stumbling upwards, uh, I've never lost sight of the fact that I, I appreciate the value of honest labor. And I, and I understand that if I'm gonna succeed, I want it to be because I work hard and do the work required of me. And the work, yeah. maybe that work is required by the hillside or by the kitchen uh, table that I'm building or, or whatever it is, or, or the, the play that I'm performing on stage. Um, and and that that's what really hit me when I first discovered Wendell Berry was the respect and reverence that he gives to good, honest, hard work and the, the ethics and values in that. And so I, I think because I'm aware of my own um, failings, as it, my, my human weaknesses, like I love a shiny object as much as the next person. I, I would love to be a, to be a, a, a pub uh, regular, you know, and, and just watch sports. Um, but when I've tried all those things, I come to understand, oh, this is, I'm wasting my life. Uh, a, a, a pint should be a treat. It shouldn't be a regularity. Um, and so, uh, I don't know, for some reason, instead of loving the, the flash uh, of, of like popular culture or shiny objects, I'm drawn to men and women who, who work, whether it's working in the kitchen or sewing garments or raising sheep or stacking stone walls, I, I love to see the people who are doing the work. And, and if I can, roll up my sleeves and join in. Yeah. And you, you're, you're actually a farmer yourself, aren't you? You're a cattle breeder? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm aspiring. Um, my my uh, herd is not large um, so far. Uh, in fact, <laughs> uh, in fact, I... I we should, I, we I, should I, tell people what we're laughing about, Nick. So, so for everybody else's benefit, you, you own a pedigree belted Galloway cow at our farm, right? called Loman Bright Eye. I, I Eye Bright. Yes, Loman Eye right. Bright. That now That's has right. a calf. So yeah. It's um but you haven't you haven't been lucky enough to come and see her because of COVID and other things. No. Yeah I just bought her last year and uh and I you know our our uh friendship uh and my enjoyment of working with you and and uh being with your wonderful family um was, I was supposed to come and help you for a week of lambing this year. And also uh, right around then is when Eyebright was gonna be giving birth to her calf. Um, so the, those are some of the terrible, you know, the things that I'm, I'm missing by being stuck at home during the quarantine. Um, but I, I'm looking forward to a long and uh, happy education as my, as my herd grows to perhaps two or even three three head <laughs> that that sounds good and we we went on a trip together to meet a, a very esteemed breeder of belted galloways in scotland didn't we? we went we went to see Anne bell do you remember that day i certainly do um one of the funnest things about that day uh was Anne bell is is a renowned uh, award-winning breeder of belted galloways uh and james was going to visit her to to see about perhaps purchasing some of her highly valuable stock to, to grow his herd. And I got to see uh, the, the, um, the beautiful dance, the, the uh, flirtation of, uh, of great stock breeders where Anne would show James a couple of, of heifers and say, well, I, th I, I suppose I could part with one of these two. And James knew that he that this was a gesture, and he was supposed to say, "I don't think so. Those aren't quite up to the quality of what I'm looking for." And this went back and forth all day long. So she said, "Okay, well, come come up the hill. What about this one?" And he said, "I don't know." And James would say, "I don't I don't like that one, but what about 
those two beauties back in the barn. And she would say, no, I'm not prepared to sell those. And at the end of, the, of this long negotiation, James said, well, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna buy anything today. Thank you, Anne. And, and we were on our way after a lovely bowl of soup. She served us red pepper soup. And, uh, and I learned all about the, the many uh, species of, of the tit. Uh, the a great many tits were, were flying to the bushes outside her window. Um, and once we left, James then emailed me the next day and said, uh, or no, it, it was like a week later, uh, he said, it worked perfectly. Anne emailed me and said, you have a very discerning eye. And now that I can <laughs> trust that you are a good breeder, I'm going to make some of the cows available to you that you were interested in so that i mean uh, that was a great education that that was nearly a year ago i still haven't managed to buy one of those Anne is Anne is one of the toughest people to do business with i've ever met she's she's incredible yeah that was and, i mean um, that's that's i mean that's part of what i love about this this education is uh, i'm much more interested in seeing uh for me seeing farming seeing good farming happen feels more substantial than than seeing anything uh in a city okay. but um but your, your family uh, you mentioned it briefly at the start your 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 uncles or your cousins are farmers in the midwest yeah my my uh my two uncles and their families uh are still farming corn and soybeans um when i was growing up they also had pigs um, that would go to market. And, uh, and so I've always, I've always had that relationship that you touch on, um, kind of with your grandfather, um, more than your dad in the, in the book where, where, um, you're seeing when you're seeing both of them exhibit their prowess in the fields with, with the animals, with, uh, machinery, uh, I always had a sensibility of, um, of, of heroism. Like if one day I want to grow a mustache and wear a hat and drive a tractor, like, like my grandpa, Mike. And I, I, I wanted to ask you though, um, I had that fascination as a kid, but, uh, I also didn't enjoy work the way I do now. Like it was only in my twenties that I came to understand as a carpenter, um, Oh, I, this feels amazing. Like I can, I can use my skills and my tools to earn money to, you know, to take care of me and my loved ones. That's incredible. Um, but as a kid, did you also have that? I mean, you, you write um, with, with a great sense of, of romance and even nostalgia about, you know, learning to farm from your dad and your grandfather. Uh, but did, were you a typical kid? You know, when did it kick in for you? that you felt, so, oh, I want to carry this on. So I, I basically in the first part of the book, I sort of tell this story. So I think my, my, first, my first memories are like lots of farm kids. I followed them around. I did the things they did. I enjoyed the good bits on sunny days when they're making hay and you roll the hay bales to your grandfather and he stacks them and things. I liked all the romantic bits. And then I think I got to maybe eight or nine or maybe even 10 years old. And I didn't want to do the dirty bits. And there was, a sort of <laughs> there was a sort of moment where I think I could have quite happily not been a farmer, that there was, there was something better on the TV. It was Saturday morning and I'd rather have stayed in the house. And yeah, I think I had several, as I described in the first part of the book, I had several months where my granddad was trying to teach me it was marvelous. My dad was sort of getting to the stage where I was like, well, you'll have to do some work now. You're not going to sit in the house and do nothing. Um, but I didn't really want to go out. And yeah, I think, I think uh, maybe with different kinds of parents, I might have drifted into another kind of life and done other things. Uh, I kind of thank my lucky stars that my old man was quite tough and made me, made me go out because it was in the next few months that I fell in love with, the, fell in love with what we did. Um, yeah, and as I write about in the book, um, I remember there being a moment a few months after that where I didn't want to sneak back in the house anymore. I didn't, so suddenly, suddenly TV didn't matter more than what my grandfather was doing or even what my dad was doing. And yeah, I'm, I'm not going to pretend every day on a farm is wonderful. There are days where you're cold and wet and you think this sucks. I want to go back in the house and get warm. But yeah, I, more or less ever since then, I've, I've 
I've loved, I've loved the good bits and I've endured the bad bits probably. Yeah. Sure. Well, so, so here's the thing um, that, that I think is one of the big questions for our time. Uh, if we are to, you know, turn around our, our, the food producing systems of our civilization, you and I are among a small minority of people who understand the, the fidelity one must pay to a home place and understanding and, and, and living in a way that we see how we participate as, as members of nature. You know, nature is not there for us to dominate and, and force into submission, that, that's what's gotten us in so much trouble. Instead, how do we, how do we dance and live um, among the cycles of nature? So we, we understand that, that's why we're here, that's, you know, what, that's the message we're trying to help people understand. The vast majority of the urban population who d perhaps have never had that, I, that sense of a home place, like this is the piece of land that we pay attention to and we care about the health of it. How do we get those people, because we need those people's votes to, um, you know, to, to bring our country around? We, we do need their votes. I think, you're, I think there's another part to this, maybe you're too kind to farmers on, which is, um, and I can say this because I am a farmer, I think maybe part of the problem is also me or us and your, your uncles, right? We have to, we have to persuade the people listening to this podcast to care about this stuff. So either they spend more in the store or they search out the right stuff or they vote for different people. But we also need to, I have friends down the road who don't agree with me about all of this. And, and you have two uncles. In some ways, the friends and the uncles part is quite tricky too, right? You, I don't know. Do, do you have a magic solution for going back and telling your uncles maybe there's another way to farm? Because that's a, that's a tricky conversation, right? Absolutely. And, and the answer is no, I don't. I mean, their livelihood is entrenched in the, in the industrial agribusiness. Like they earn their living producing vast uh, amounts of, of corn and soybeans of, of the building blocks for uh, all the soy products and all of the corn syrup uh, products, which is you know, part of the, of the industrial problem. And it's, you know, it's, it's sort of emblematic of the way so much of, of our Western civilization is, uh, is entrapped in a, a corporate cage, you know. The, uh, the number of people that are left, um, that, are, that are left uh, so, sort of um, hypnotized into the submission of just following the channels of corporations, you know, the, the corporations own the media, the, 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 they also, in our country, they own the lobbyists, like, so all the messaging most of the people are getting is everything's okay, or, you know, the way we need to, to fix this is, uh, the, the way we need to fix beef is to get rid of, of beef altogether, when, anyone who looks at the science says, no, 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 it's not the cow is not the problem. It's how we're producing beef. That's the problem. We're producing it like a factory product and that's horrible and filthy. And so, you know, it, on all the levels, uh, we need to uh, attack it with the, the farmers in the system all the way up to the people who are consuming. But it, I think in America, the, the only way it's going to change is, through legislation as from, from the top down, because there, there's a great many people, you know, we, we keep saying, uh, okay, well, let's eat organic. Let's, let's, you know, eat non GMO products, but because lobbyists are able to actually change that kind of language, those words then become useless. So now if, you know, if, if in America, if, if a car is, is put together, there's some law that's like, if it's 16% put together in an American factory, all the products can come from overseas, but you can say it's made in the USA. We, so it's, we, it's, we have, it's defeating that bullshit. We, we have the same bullshit here. So what, whatever system of rules you have uh, for British lamb or British beef, uh, 
sometimes it's, I mean, I, I don't know the intricacies of it, but you see these sort of cheat, cheating labels where it's actually from New Zealand, but they've done something to it in the United Kingdom, uh, the packaging or the slight shift to it at this end, and they're putting a sort of British flag on it or something, and you think, hang on a minute, Brit British consumers are trying to make good choices, and this is just bewildering. You're, if it isn't illegal, then it's sort of morally bankrupt, a lot of the things that they're doing, and the supermarkets here, I think they do the same same thing in America. They have sort of pretend farms. So they'll mm -hmm. invent like sort of black, blackberry farm. You can have the blackberry farm lamb or the blackberry farm apple pie. Uh, right. It turns out there's no blackberry farm at all. It's a corporate fiction. It's, it's a lie really to persuade people. And, and what's particularly horrible about that is that you've got really busy people spending their money as responsibly as they can. They see the blackberry farm label and they think I'm doing the right thing. I'm supporting a farm. And that, you know, the corporations ripping those people's up, ripping them off, abusing their sort of moral judgment. It's, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of bad stuff happening. And uh, despite loving lots of things, lots of good things about America, at the moment, Nick, I'm having to speak against, I and lots of other people are having to speak against our government doing a free trade bill with the Trump administration, because we see that very, very clearly as not so much a backdoor, but a front door way of lowering all of our standards. Of, uh, and, and our standards need to be higher. They don't need to be lower. Um, we need to higher animal welfare standards, higher environmental standards and regulations. Um, but because we've got in a mess through Brexit, we now have lots of politicians telling us we need to just get in the room with the Trump people, sign on the dotted line. And yeah, it's, it's very clear to many of us that that drives down our standards. That's a way of undermining the, what, what, what's good in our system. So it's, it's not anti-Americanism, it's, it's trying to protect ourselves from that, that system which has got out of hand, those lobbyists, those big corporations. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's, um, I mean, it's the symptom of, of capitalism, whether it's American or, or European or elsewhere, but it's, it's always fascinated me, like, you can understand if, if, you're, uh, if you're a maker of uh, Wellingtons, um, that you're, you're going to streamline your production in a way so that it costs you as little as possible to produce a Wellington that's waterproof and it will hopefully last a long time. We, we get that. But the, when, when, those, uh, when those values are applied to food, that baffles me that, that, we're, you know, that our governments uh, allow our, our food producers to cut, uh, to cut corners and re basically make food less healthy for us so that people can make more money selling it to us. That just <laughs> that seems really counterintuitive. And, and that's, I feel like, one of the things at, at the heart of, uh, of what drives us. And we, we have a mutual friend, don't we, in, in Wendelbury, as mentioned earlier. He's, uh, for anyone that doesn't know this listing, he's, he's amazing, right? He, 1964, he writes The Unsettling of America. I mean, I turn up. I turn up that was 76. 76, okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I turn up in 2020 and say, hey everybody, hey, everybody, this is broken, and other people as well, but he's there 30, 40 years earlier, right? He's, he's amazing. That's uh, that's amazingly wise. He saw this very early, right? He did, yeah. Um, and, and Rachel Carson with Silent Spring. And, and I mean, you know, agrarian thinkers have, have been calling this out uh, for decades and centuries even. Um, but it's, you know, once again, their, their messaging is considered underground because nobody can get rich <laughs> off, of, off of it. And that's the, that's the counterintuitive thinking. It's more important for people, for a few people to get rich than it is for a great many people to eat well in a way that also supports the land and the nature and, and the animals and so forth. We, we, we joke here that no traveling salesman ever come to the farm anymore. This is considered a, a, a totally useless place to sell things now. Uh, because we we don't buy very much. We're trying to we're trying to produce lamb and beef and and pigs, and we're trying to do this by buying the absolute minimum of stuff. By trying to have a farm that has a genuine nutrient cycle that's circular, uh, and yeah, we don't buy we don't buy the things they sell. So yeah, it's. Uh, but when you travel to the American Midwest, you can see that that's. 
that's a system which really belongs to five, six, ten companies, right? Everything you sell, everything you buy as a farmer comes from yeah. the same handful of corporations. They own the whole system, right? They do. And, and it, you've, you've taken me back to your earlier question about why, like, I, I, I've sort of done great. Um, I, I should be on a yacht putting my feet up and smoking cigars, um, which is I learned from rap videos. Um, but instead, I want to come visit you and, and see how you and your family live around your home and hearth and, and see how you farm and help you stack a stone wall. And part of it is because I have the good fortune to have seen uh, that, and it's because of the family I grew up in, the incredibly good and valuable time that you can have, that you can create with a family that doesn't require buying stuff. And that's, that's one of the main, you know, messages I think that consumerism wants to, uh, wants to eradicate. You know, you want to have a good time. You got to, you have to buy our products. You have to buy our video games and, and, you know, you have to invest in your time and money and what's, what's on your screen. And you, you know, you and, and your uh, heroic wife, you, you are married, right? I, I meant to ask you, do you, you have four kids. How do you find the time to feed those kids and take care of all these sheep um, and, and cows? We, we both know the answer to that. She's down in the house right now, probably watching this while she's doing some paperwork and running the business and all the rest of it. So you, you know the answer. I have, I have an amazing wife that props me up and pushes me forward and enables me to do all of these things. She's currently quite mad with me because I've had a day where I've been distracted by a lot of nonsense and I should have been spending more time helping her. But she, yeah, she's in the house right now. I'm hoping this counts as an apology. Yeah, sorry, Helen. I, uh, help, I me hope so. help me out, I'm in trouble. I hope so too. But I, every, you know, the, the fact that you, um, that you and, and your uh, heroic bride understand that you can turn off the channels and say to your family, let's play a game. Let's have a fire and read, and read books. Let's, let's eat, let's make food together. You know, let's, let's go out uh, for, for a walk and look at the, at the trees and the birds and the moths and, and the, the nature together. And that, that is all so much better than any, you know, any comedy you're ever going to come across on a channel. Hey, I have to say, Nick, we didn't realize that was unusual. It's, it's only since we started hanging out with you and other people, maybe from other worlds or other places who've took, I mean, that's how pretty much how my mom and dad brought us up. And I know my, some of my sisters, uh, some of my sisters, it makes it sound like I've got dozens. One of my sisters is listening to this and yeah, she's like that with her kids. So I think, yeah, I think we're just sort of, in a, in a way, we're lucky. We belong to a slightly older family-based sort of way of being. Um, so it wasn't any great foresight on our behalf. But, um, yeah, it's nice when people come and they say, wow, that's amazing that you sit down with your kids for every meal and stuff. It's, yeah, you forget, it's easy to overlook that those things matter, I guess. Yeah. I, th I think so. And it, and it leads into some I, – I, I have a, a very important question for you. Last night, we watched this brand new documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. And I highly, everyone must watch this thing ASAP. It's, it's a bunch of the people who, inv who created Facebook and Twitter and Uber, the, the programmers, the, the tech geniuses who created the algorithms. There's the guy who created the like button. There's the guy who created endless scrolling. And what the documentary is about is, uh, is how dark and, and evil uh, of a turn all of this screen usage has, has taken and how it all has been crafted to addict us to always be on our screens. And so it, it was quite moving. And Megan and I, you know, uh, my wife, Megan and I, uh, when it was over, said, okay, that, that was an incredible wake up call. And we go th through and we're cleaning out apps and like cutting our usage of our phones way back down. You, and I said to her, the first thing that I think when I think I should just get rid of social media 
I think, but, but James and Helen, like the, it's the, your work on Twitter and Instagram is better than any TV channel I've ever had. Like you both do such an amazing job of all of your work, running your farm, running your family. And then at the same time, uh, feeding an audience of, of th hundreds of thousands um, with, with imagery and recipes and, you know, humor and, and hardship, the story of, of your farm. And so my question is, how do you feel about that? Like, I, I, on, on one hand, those, those services, those apps have so much negative uh, impact. Um, how do you how do you reconcile that? And also tied to that is what's your guys' policy with your kids and screen time? So we, um, I have a sort of love hate relationship with social media. I never, I never liked it initially. I thought it was a lot of rubbish. I got sort of seduced by it by doing it. And the 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 upside of it is, and I have to remind myself of this sometimes when I'm in a grumpy mood with it. The upside is I've met met virtually and met really through it like the most amazing people i've ever met um and i've got amazing friends all around the world through it and there's a a bunch of really amazing people who care about us and what we stand for and will fight for us and back us and buy my books and all that sort of stuff um so that there's there's undoubtedly an upside it's really nice right but um yeah in my i have to say in my darker moments i could just delete the whole thing and and part of me thinks this will probably sound disingenuous because I'm, I'm having an interesting life at the moment and I'm selling lots of books and I'm a writer and things. But part of me, I, I didn't really want that initially. I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be respected as a writer. Um, but part of me wants to delete it all and just hide and not hide, just retreat back to just look after ourselves and our farm. And I might, I tell myself I might do that someday. Maybe, maybe you'll all laugh at me in five years time, but Part of me, part of me thinks that's a healthy thing to do. I'm not, I'm not sure we should all be chasing, uh, chasing other people's attention quite so much, or or so keen for other people's attention. I th when I look around me, I think some of the most sensible, healthy people I know aren't chasing it at all. They don't care if anybody's watching. They don't care if anybody likes what they're doing. They're they're just in it and they're doing it. And that's really what the people I came from. And part of me wants to go back to that quite quickly. <laughs> but, but, I, but then I have to remind myself how incredibly lucky I am. I get to write a book and thousands of people read it because they know about me. And, and there's, there's definitely an upside. Uh, the kids at the moment, the kids have gone through a few years of not really being interested in it. And then they're hitting 12, 13, 14, the girls. And they're, they're starting to sort of flirt with it themselves. So my daughter Molly's, who you know, is, is interested in making films and editing them and maybe putting stuff on YouTube. And I think she's, she's starting to enter that world where you, you're a little bit seduced by it. You can see it's exciting, it's maybe fun, it can make things happen. But it's also a little bit embarrassing and it's a little bit intrusive. It's, it's a strange mix of things, isn't it? It is, yeah. And, and, and I'm, let's be honest, I'm, I'm not remotely famous compared to you. You, you, must, for a, you and Megan for a long time now must have had to learn how to live a sensible life surrounded by some quite unsensible stuff. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And we, um, we lived happily for uh, many years without using any social media. It was only once I started touring as a humorist and writing books myself that I began to use Twitter to promote those efforts. And, uh, and that sort of opened the door in our household to Twitter and Instagram. And it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Like um, the, the, the amount of stuff that comes in and I keep the people I'm following uh, to a low number, but even so the feed, I can, it's like a stream. And I stop yeah. maybe a couple times a day and see what's going on, going by on the stream but I can't remotely ever see all the stuff that's coming at me, uh, which I think helps. It helps me maintain a distance and not feel like I have to engage uh, with everything. But it's, um, it's strange. It's, you know, like anything, it has to be curated. I mean, beer is wonderful, uh, but you can have too much of it. Um, yeah. There, there yeah. are many things like that in life. 
and, and it, there's a there's a thin line, isn't there, between showing people things you love and pretending and sort of performing <laughs> some kind of life because that's what you think they want. I mean, I think everybody that has any kind of public life is battling with that the whole time, isn't it? I mean, I like, I'll give you an example today. So today was a kind of sad day on the farm. We, we harvested, which is a euphemism for kill. We killed our two pigs. So the, I love those pigs. They're amazing. I, I loved having them on the farm, tried to give them the best life possible. We've had that day today where you think, okay, that, that cycle comes to an end. And then, yeah, just tonight I thought I didn't tell anybody I killed the pigs because I, I know what that's going to happen. That turns into a whole debate about how do you feel about it or you're terrible because you did it or it unleashes right. a whole a whole pile of energy, good, bad, whatever. And sometimes you just don't feel like that. So, so you end up not quite telling the whole truth. And yeah, I, I struggle with that. It's the truth should be told, really, but who's got the energy to tell the truth and face up to it all the time? I probably haven't. Um, well, that, we're busy, yeah, that, right? <laughs> that's the thing. There, there's um, Wendell Berry's uh, heroic wife, Tanya, um, published a book last year called, um, I think it's called For the Hog Killing. And it's a, it's a book of uh, photographs that she took in the late 70s uh, when a, a group of neighbor farmers get together once a year and do their hog killing. They butcher the hogs and, and process them into all of the products that they make out of a pig. They use every bit from, from snout to tail. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things that uh, is, is very important, salient information that we've glossed over. We've given, we've, we've coddled our society into not needing to know about the abattoir. And, and, you know, and that allows people to say, oh, how could you, how could you kill those cute pigs when, you know, that leads to the question, well, where do you think <laughs> your bacon comes from? Where do you think, you know, all of that food comes from? And it's, it's, it's getting, getting us back to that understanding, to just living more in the reality of the cycles of nature that involve birth and blossom and decay and death and rinse and repeat. That's right. I, I've, I have endless conversations with my editor about my, my elevator pitch. And one of the things she says, and I think she's absolutely right, is um, when people ask me what can people do who aren't farmers to, to engage with it more, to think about it more, she very wisely says, tell people to grow something. Even, you know, everyone doesn't have a huge garden, but like a little, even if it's just like a little windowsill box, put some lettuce yeah. seeds in it. Just get your hands in the soil, do the basics. And I, I, think, she's, I think she's right. Um, hi to Chloe if she's listening. Um, we're, we're getting too far away from a lot of these simple elemental things. And then, and then we don't know enough to sort of make sensible ethical decisions, I think, a lot of the time. Uh, I don't mean to be patronizing or rude about people who aren't farmers, but um, if we don't have some connection to those realities, how do we understand them? You, you know, and we were, we were told yeah. that... It, we were told that getting further and further away from the land or farming or food or the field was progress. And yet we get a long way down that road and you look back and you think, actually, I don't think we thought this through properly. And yeah, like I, I saw uh, somebody shared a letter with me today about, um, and I think they're listening tonight, about their teenage son. And they'd been asked at school to uh, say what they'd learned from the lockdown, the COVID lockdown. And... Uh, and, and it was this boy's mum had shared it with me and she'd said, uh, he'd said at school, uh, the lockdown was the best time of my life because I realised that this is a 13, 14 year old boy. He'd said, I realised that I could do my schoolwork in a third of the day and I could go and work on the local farm for two thirds of the day through the, the daylight hours. Uh, and I've discovered that I want to be a farmer. And uh, he's not anti-school. He just worked out he could do the schoolwork in the evening. And now yeah. he's had to go back to school and he was, he was trying to make this sort of articulate argument of the kind that I tried to make as a teenager. Why is the world like this? Why do you people want to take me away from the land, from food, from things that I love? And yeah, I had a, I had a lot of sympathy with that teenager because that was me really. Yeah. There, um, Wendell Berry has, has a great quote that I will paraphrase, but he, but he says that, uh, you know, by, by age 13 or 14, uh, almost all human beings know how to make a baby. 
these days. But uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a 30 year old who knows how a potato is made. I, 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 you, know, you know, I now have a slightly funny life. I end up in front of roomfuls of people doing book talks, all that jazz. Um, I get queues of people coming to me after I've done a talk. And what do they really want? They really want to talk to somebody about stuff they're trying to work out. They're, they're good, intelligent people. They just, they don't know how to, they, they want to talk through with somebody. What should they eat? And, and what, should they, what should they buy? And how do they support the good farming and not the bad farming? And, and, and I, I'm full of respect for those people because they're trying to work it out. But modern life makes it really difficult to know that stuff. When it, we don't teach it in school. Um, in, yeah. in somewhere like Britain or in some of the American cities, people are now three generations away from any of that knowledge. And I think it's sad. I think maybe in some way we have to rebuild that. We have to get... Even if, even if people live in cities, even if they're on low incomes, I think we have to find a way so that people are close to food production, they're, they're part of it in some way as much as possible. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of allotments or community gardens or urban food production. I think those things are really important because otherwise we're going to end up horribly disconnected. Well, I, uh, I think this, this is, I could talk to you all day like this, but um, we're gonna get in trouble if we don't take a few questions from the viewers. Um, one, I'll, I'll, not, I'll knock out of the way and I'll ask you as well. Um, there's a lot of talk of Wendell Berry today and someone's, uh, Duncan A is asking, uh, what's a good Wendell Berry book to start with? And the, the, one, the main answer people usually give is The Unsettling of America from 1976, which um, uh, just so happens, I, I uh, recorded an audio version of that um, at the beginning of this year. So if you have kids that, are, um, that hate to go to sleep at night, that's something you can play out loud that'll put them right out. Um, me can reading I, Wendell can I, Berry. Okay, so one of, I'm, I'm gonna chuck another title in. This is probably for people in the UK, but there was a collection of Wendell's essays published called A World Ending Fire. And I, I, behind the scenes, I had a small role in that. I think me banging on about Wendell the whole time helped for that to be published by Penguin. Um, and in that, there's an essay called The Native Hill. Is that what it's called? Nick? Yeah. I think one of, one of his best essays is A Native Hill. And it's, um, in some ways, it's a little bit like the book that I've just written, English Pastoral. It's it's an essay looking back about the farming of his childhood and how it changed and a sort of growing awareness that maybe, maybe it wasn't changing for the better. So that's a world ending fire. Those essays are amazing, but he's written so many books. He's an amazing guy, right? He is. And I, I'm also just a massive fan of his poetry and his fiction as well. Um, if you like fiction, I, I think a great appetizer, there's a book called Fidelity and there's a book called Watch With Me that are both collections of short stories. And that's, that was how I got into them. And that, it's, a, it's a great gateway drug. And I think uh, if people maybe aren't huge book readers, there's a documentary, which I think you had a hand in, Nick, called Look and See. That's, that's a really good starting point, getting hold of that documentary. It is, yeah. That's some of my best film work. Um, my, my hands and tools appear in that film, making a three-legged stool. And this... There's, there's, sorry, I'm a super nerd on all things Wendell Berry now, but it, there's a clip in that film, Look and See, which I think is also on YouTube, where he, I think he was on a panel for, discussing with Earl Butts, who was uh, Nixon's Secretary of Agriculture, That's right. uh, and they're discussing the future. And uh, Earl Butts is saying, get big, get out, uh, let's grow corn from horizon to horizon, this is the future. And Wendell sits sort of quietly along the table and tries to articulate why this might be an incomplete vision of what farming should be. And it's a fascinating conversation because they talk complete, uh, without criticizing either of them, they talk completely past each other. They're talking about different things. They're talking with different values in different ways. And I don't, I don't think Earl Butts understood a word that Wendell said, but it's fascinating to look back and see that they tried to have that conversation. It is. And, and uh, you know, these things, it, 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 uh, is good proof that with patience and stubbornness, uh, the conversation can continue and hopefully eventually uh, produce good results. 
Um, there's a few questions about uh, the naming, and I think it's interesting that, that how did um, Lomond Eyebright get her name, and then uh, when she had her calf, how, how then does she get her name? Okay, so all uh, pedigree sheep and pedigree cattle in Britain, certainly in the systems that, that I know, have a herd prefix or name. So the herd is called Lomond, uh, and they're a herd of cattle that live on the banks of Loch Lomond in Scotland. Um, so all of the calves born in that herd were called Lomond, and then they get uh, an individual name. So uh, sometimes the individual name has to start with a year letter. Uh, I don't think that's true in the Belgian Galloways, but somebody might correct me. Um, so she's from the Lomond herd, and she was called Eyebright, which is one, an English meadow flower. And then when she has a calf, um, if she'd had a calf in the Lomond herd on their land, it would be called Lomond something. Uh, because she was, the calf was born in our herd, on our land, it now has our herd prefix, which is the name of our farm, which is Racy Gill. So Nick's calf is now called Racy Gill, and we preferred bright eye to eye bright, so we did a little twist to So Nick's uh, heifer calf, which is now six months old, is called Racy Gill Eye Bright. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm hoping that Nick forgets all about us, leaves this beautiful heifer calf on our farm and never asks for any money. I don't know how this works. We, I, I also don't. We'll, we'll see. But, uh, because um, I'm, I, I legitimately have to ask, uh, do we then, uh, do we each um, have ownership, half ownership of her calf? How does that I, work? I think... I think possession is nine tenths of the law. You never come, you never call, you never hear. <laughs> right. So I'll I'll, uh, I'll take it up with you next time I see you over a stacked stone wall. That's right. Uh, no, I'm sure I'm sure, I'm sure the heifer calf yours as well. We'll talk about that when you next come. Yeah. Here's a good question, James. Uh, Jess Conwell writes: My local council has recently put a ban on meat in all festivals and events in our borough for climate change. Some people are very angry about this because we believe it should be our own choice to eat meat or not. Is this something as a farmer that you're worried about? It's a good chance to mention uh, another documentary, um, The Sacred Cow. That's right, by our mutual friend, Diana Rogers. So if people are interested in these issues, they should watch that, this documentary called Sacred Cow, which is very good presents a more positive case about cattle. I think um, I, I stay clear from telling anybody what they should eat. I think that's a personal decision. They can make their own minds up. Uh, I think you summed it up earlier. Those of us that are really uh, interested in this think it isn't what you eat, but how it's farmed, how it's produced. And I, I wrote an essay in a, one of the newspapers this week in the UK saying exactly that. I'm I'm less interested in what people eat than how it's produced. And you can produce anything in dreadful ways. You can produce corn for bread in dreadful ways. You can produce lettuce in dreadful ways. You sure as hell can produce cattle and pigs and chickens in, in dreadful ways. Um, but you can also produce all of those things in highly sustainable ways. And if they're in mixed systems, they're in uh, rotational systems, uh, uh, if, if they're grazed in the right way, if there's really high welfare standards, if they're in a patchwork landscape, which is doing other things for biodiversity and doing other things for the climate, then I personally have zero problem eating, eating animals. I, I've had a moment today where I've, I've seen that in the, in the raw and that, that always stops me short. I look at it and I think, okay, have a little think about this, James, just make sure you're completely right. Um, but we did, we killed two pigs today. I think it was, I think it was time for them to go. It was the only bad day they had in their lives. They had a lot of amazing days. They lived in an amazing place. I, I'm at peace with that. Um, other people can make other choices. It's not for me to persuade them otherwise. I think, I think the problem is when we're making blanket rules, where we're saying beef's all one thing, or pork is all one thing, or plants are all one thing. And, th and that's not true. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, so I think, we, I think sort of blanket rules are problematic. I agree, and and um, to to give a simplified answer to or sort of debunk one popular piece of propaganda, um, if you and this is uh, some of what the the documentary and book, great book, Sacred Cow, is about. If you if you 
uh, farm your meat animals with uh, regenerative practices, with rotational grazing and so forth, your farm then becomes a, a carbon sink and actually uh, is, is very good for the climate. And if you farm your meat animals in a factory with crazy sludge ponds and, and all the rest, then you're a horrible uh, violator of, of carbon. Um, I mean, ju yeah, just, just to give you a practical example of that, I, I can graze my sheep in ways which, uh, which don't trap carbon or which release carbon and, and spoil soil, or I can graze my sheep and cattle in ways that, that add carbon. So in the last five years, we've, we've kind of learned and begun to implement uh, uh, different grazing practices, which is basically, at its simplest, leaving the ground for longer, letting the grass get longer, then grazing it more heavily, but more quickly, which results in more trampling. We've been able to raise the organic matter in our soils by 2% within five years. And that's, I think that's 180 tons per hectare of carbon trapped on our land. Just a simple switch to grazing practices and you can switch a thing from bad to good. So, um, I, but having said that, I have good friends and I think some of them are listening to this all around the world and some of them are vegans. And when I talk to them about why they're vegan, I think maybe what I hear back eight or nine times out of 10 is because I don't know how to judge this. I, I don't know how to find the right beef rather than the wrong beef or the right chicken rather than the wrong chicken. Uh, so they're using it as a way to show some moral agency. And I, I respect that. If I lived in a city and I couldn't tell the difference between the two different kinds of beef, I might make that choice as well. So I'm not gonna come on here and badmouth anybody. I think people are trying the best they can. I, I agree and thank you for that judicious answer. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the question uh, from Candice Kachowski or Kakoski uh, is what K names did you end up with? Oh, good question. So, so this year, um, our, ram, uh, our tups, uh, our tips, uh, our, our male, 18 month old male rams, which we sell to other flocks. So we have like a I like to think anyway, an elite flock where we breed these high value breeding animals that we sell to other flocks. And uh, this year's year letter was K. So all of our rams are called Racy Gill, which is the herd prefix. And then they have a K. So we had, I'm a Liverpool football club supporter, as Nick knows, because he once got me tickets. Um, uh, so we had King Kenny, we had Klopp, uh, we had various other, oh, I've forgotten what the other ones were. They're written on a piece of paper, but we, um, we, we used a lot of the names that people suggested on social media. That's one of the, one of the good things about social media is you're never short of K names. If you have a lot of friends. <laughs> um, and, and I guess uh, let's, let's wrap up, you know, um, we're, uh, we're looking at a, an apartment that James has on his farm. Um, and right behind your head is uh, the, the first night, that uh, I came to stay with you, it was bitter cold. I, 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 I forget how it translates into Celsius, but it was, I mean, it was close to zero degrees Fahrenheit. It was really freezing. And you brought me out here uh, and said, here's the wood stove. Uh, here's some wood. Good night, we'll see you in the morning. And I, uh, I slept on that love seat right there as close as I could get to the wood stove. And uh, again, was reminded at how soft we become riding in our vehicles, you know, putting shoes on our feet, like, a, <laughs> and all the rest. And um, it, it really makes me long to get back out there and, and uh, develop some more calluses with you. So I look forward. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just really disappointed that you have like Hollywood lighting on your end and like a beautiful complexion, like you've been putting makeup on. I look like a guy who's been up a mountain chasing sheep all day with bad English lighting. This is like the 1950s all over. I'm gray, I'm destroyed, you're the future, you're bright. Uh, it's a nightmare. Just, and the, this is just the, California. The 70 yeah, behind me is because my mom tomorrow is having a 70th birthday party. So I want to say happy birthday to my mom. And we have a tighter lockdown coming after Sunday. So we're going to have a birthday, a small birthday party for her here tomorrow. And um, 
Yeah, Hel Helen's mum thought you looked like a criminal the first time you came to visit Nick. I just think I should drop that in. I, I don't disagree with that. I, I had a shaved head and a massive red beard. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I'd say she's, she's got a good eye. And I would also say it takes one to know one. Oh, oh, that's fighting talk. Wait till, wait, wait till uh, Granny Piper hears that. You're in big trouble, Nick. But yeah, th thank you. Thank you for doing this. It's been great fun. Well, it's my pleasure. I, I highly recommend uh, this. This makes a great gift. Um, it also, if you have a, a really crooked table, it fits very neatly under one leg. Um, I'm, I'm crazy about, about this book, and I'm so grateful I've gotten to know you. And, uh, and I hope that you continue to live and thrive and prosper and treat us to more of your beautiful writing. Thank you. And if I, if I have to buy a very expensive Herbic Tup in about three weeks' time, a ram, I'm rather hoping that we could have some Hollywood help with that. Have you got any friends that have got a lot of money or anything? I don't know. Give me a call. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick and James. Thank you so much for such a wonderfully thought-provoking talk tonight. Um, thank you to everybody who tuned in. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the event and a link to watch the full replay of the event will sh follow shortly. Um, I hope you have a wonderful party tomorrow, James and uh, Nick. Enjoy the rest of your day. Everybody have a great evening. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you and cheers.